Welcome to this virtual reunion session. Today, we are pleased to be joined by Aaron Scott, who will moderate a conversation between two of our alumni. Aaron is a senior lecturer in the Technological Innovation, Entrepreneurship, and Strategic Management Group at MIT Sloan. An expert in entrepreneurship, Aaron's work focuses on uncertainty and strategic development in early stage ventures. We are delighted to have her here, Erin. Please feel free to turn your camera on and take it away. Great, thank you, Patsy, so much for inviting me to moderate this uh, exciting discussion today. And good morning to, to all of the alumni from a, a very lovely day here in Cambridge. Uh, we are fortunate to welcome two incredible serial entrepreneurs and Sloanies uh, back to, to our virtual campus to share their journey uh, from Sloan classmates to co-founders and share their process of building Cambridge Landmark, as well as take a bit of time to really reflect on their experience over the past 15 months as the, the pandemic has you know, affected all, all parts of our personal and professional lives, um, and in particular has also affected the hospitality industry. Um, and so we're excited to have a very engaging and interactive discussion today. And, and in particular, uh, they are very much looking forward to, to questions and comments from, from you guys. So feel free to post questions in the chat. So from there, I wanna you know, just jump in and make sure we have the time to really focus on the, the discussion and learnings from Pedro and John. And so welcome again to, to both of you. It is good to see you. I know that the foundation of, of Cam Cambridge Landmark, as well as your relationship um, as co-founders, really rests in, your, in both your time here at Sloan, but also in your respective paths post-Sloan um, and, and respective entrepreneurial uh, journeys thereafter. And so by way of introduction, can you go both kind of catch us up a little bit, kind of the post-Sloan, uh, you know, just before you co-founded uh, Cambridge Landmark? And perhaps we could start with you, John, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to Pedro. So after Sloan, I went to work with Merrill Lynch in, in New York in investment banking. After that, I returned to Brazil to practice law for 10 years. And that's when I founded my first company, which was my own law practice, which grew to about 50 attorneys over time. In 2014, I was invited by a client of my firm to join him as a CEO uh, in his real estate development company in Miami, Regalia Developers. Uh, there I developed two condo projects, uh, Regalia in Sunny Island and 1000 Museum by architect Zaha Hadid in Biscayne Boulevard. Uh, those projects were a combined uh, a billion dollars in, in, in sales. And, and that's what I've done before founding um, Cambridge Landmark. Great, thank you. Uh, and Pedro? So similar path, I went uh, to London, work as an investment bank in doing, doing M&A. Um, then after that, I left, uh, you know, joined a private equity company. Uh, I was the number three there. We started with um, about 5 million euros under management. We grew to about a, a, a billion one. Uh, so there was a, a decent run. I, I left and I, I, I started uh, you know, my own fund, uh, raising about 100 million. And um, I exited that in 2015 when I kind of reconnected with João in Miami when we started uh, Cambridge together. Great. Um, and I know, uh, Pedro, that you and John really came together early in your time at Sloan in accounting class. So can you share a bit about that experience and then, you know, about that your, your reconnection and this decision to really found Cambridge Landmark? Yeah, so we, we were part of the same ocean. Um, I'm an engineer by training. Uh, João is a lawyer. And, um, you know, we are sitting in accounting class and I look at him, I said, this doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Um, you know, things like statistics were much more, uh, you know, kind of my, my cup of tea. Um, and, you know, interesting enough, I think, you know, uh, most of the things we've done today and I've done in my past career and being an investment banker, you know, had to get up uh, to accounting, uh, this knowledge of accounting, like pretty quickly. So, yeah. 
no no question that accounting was uh, was difficult credit and debit inverted concepts and and certainly extremely important on a going forward basis uh, uh, for everything that we've we've done we've also organized together the brazilian trip in our uh, two years in our MBA, which was a very fun to organize. At the end, Pedro couldn't go because he was in that period of time getting his uh, green card. So he couldn't really leave the US exactly at that time, but we organized together. And then the trip itself in Brazil was very, was fantastic, was very fun. I think everybody that went with us had a, a great time. And hopefully we have some of those folks in the in the crowd here today as well, uh, remembering the, that fun trip. Um, so can you tell us, uh, John, a little bit about, you know, how you came together and decided to co-found? You know, you had had this relationship about a, a decade at that point um, that you had worked together and, and, and been in close contact. But what about this decision to really co-found uh, Cambridge Landmark? Why was that really the time uh, to, to make this decision and to really also to work together? Yeah. So Pedro had founded Itacare around 2006, and it was a real estate fund uh, investing in Brazil. So uh, we worked together. Uh, I did uh, all the legal work in Brazil to support uh, from the very beginning. Uh, in fact, the first, uh, at the time we had faxes, so uh, not, not PDF by emails. So I was there in Brazil, the, the fax machine that was receiving the, the initial $11 million contribution from the investors uh, was in my law firm, was kind of uh, interesting. And Pedro was calling me, so this guy, did he send, did he not? Uh, that type of, uh, and I was, yes. Uh, I remember one guy that he expected uh, was a $500,000 contribution. At the end, the guy sent $80,000. So when the fund started, uh, it was a funny number, 11, I don't know, 11, uh, $580,000. So that's uh, um, how it went. And then when, we, when I was in Miami doing the two, the two buildings, the two condo developments at the time, and I just bought in 2014 a hotel in, in, in Miami. And I found it very interesting because the hotel was something that, that generated operating revenues that you can improve operations, you can do quite high. But at the same time, different from other businesses that are kind of hard to finance sometimes, this one you could go to the bank and you could raise based on the real estate where the hotel is based. Uh, uh, a very long term and low interest loan. So when you adjust for those things, I, I thought it was a very interesting business. So uh, we went for lunch one day uh, and we were discussing, Pedro asked me, what would I do if I had uh, uh, the time to do it? And he had sold his company. So he was looking for things to do. And I told him uh, uh, what I would do at the moment, I would buy hotels. I believe in the cash flow. I believe in the business. And at the same time, I know we can get very cheap financing uh, for the acquisitions. And that was it. Uh, a few months later, we started the company. Great. And Pedro, can you walk us through what were those the first few years? Uh, what were some of the initial investments you guys made? Uh, some of the key choices. So, so we, we, we identify a niche that um, you know we, we, we still you know focus on that, which are uh, you know transactions that are you know too large for uh, you know individuals, family offices, um, but they are too small for the big equity funds. You know, so we play you know kind of sweet spot is call it let's say forty to eighty million dollars of transaction value. You know, we we have done larger. Um, but that's kind of the, the sweet spot. Um, you know, we also uh, buying full service hotels. Um, so there's a major distinction in the industry between full service and limited service. Of Full service are the ones that, uh, you know, we have restaurants and uh, uh, club lounges and other amenities and, you know, limited services, basically, you know, you're, you know, you, you're selling rooms and, and, and that's it. So based on what, uh, you know, Joan was explaining also, once you have an operation that is more complex, like, uh, like in a full service hotel, 
you also have more room to to improve that to uh, to improve margins and and to do that more more efficiently um so so that was a characteristics of the niche and i think um the other one that was quite critical as well is that we're doing a special situation um strategy where we're going after uh you know funds that have cleaned up assets after the previous crisis the 0809 and they had their last or you know two remaining assets and they're highly motivated to you know to close that that vehicle that was uh, reaching maturity so the, that was kind of the niche that we found and uh was very successful Great, thank you. Um, John, you know, one of the questions that we received in advance of this uh, session was for you guys to, to maybe take a moment and reflect back on those early choices that Pedro just walked us through. And, you know, what things did you learn that maybe in retrospect you might have done differently or, or, or otherwise? So I... Look, I think most of the choices that we made were correct choices. So we went for some projects with a lot of uh, value add, uh, like the resort in, in Orlando, one mile from Disney that really needed a massive renovation and, and that revealed to be a very good choice. If I could have done something different, I think uh, one of the projects, uh, the hotel in Philadelphia that costed us about $130 million in acquisition, I think was, is a quite large project. And I think the overall cushion of liquidity, I would have kept um, a larger one. The, this was the property that was mostly uh, affected with the shutdown of the economy in uh, March 16. Um, but except for that, I think uh, we did a, a very, very good good run. All our projects uh, we bought for the right price. Even post-COVID, when the valuations came, they all came, um, except for, for Philadelphia, higher than the original acquisition price, some of them significantly higher. So I, I don't think, I think most of the decisions were, were essentially correct. Uh, great. You know what I'm really hearing from you all is from your comments is you had a very clear thesis of how you could create value and you really stuck to that um, as you continued to make and, and not getting swayed or distracted otherwise as you really built out this portfolio and made investments in, in each of these properties. Um, it's very interesting and I know that you know you just kind of previewed this that this uh, the hospitality industry has been significantly affected mm -hmm. um, by the pandemic. Um, you know, I know that you guys have just been very principled leaders uh, for, with respect to your team, but also incredibly innovative in how you've uh, protected uh, customers during this time. Uh, can we start with really those early days when there was just an incredible amount of uncertainty, um, you know, and, and this really un unprecedented disruption, and it was really unclear kind of where we were going. Can you guys give us a better appreciation of what that looked like in your industry and then how you two really approach decision making given that high level of uncertainty? So, um, you know, it, go, going back early in the year, um, I, I remember talking to one of my cla our classmates, uh, you know, based in Hong Kong, you know, so China was the first one to, to really shut down and see the impact and, and now hospitality was, you know, highly effective. And um, I was coming back from San Francisco in, in the plane kind of first week of March and everybody was looking at each other like, are you coughing? Are you not coughing? And, you know, go back to Miami, you know, we sat down together and say, man, we let's start, you know, be on the front foot because, you know, this is going to hit really, really bad. And, and, and it did. So we saw, just to put into perspective, about 90% decline on top line revenue. Um, if you compare that to 9-11, like New York hotels, they saw about 30% decline to, uh, to top line. Uh, financial crisis, you saw about 25, you know, across the country. So, so this was really, let's say, a major impact. We need to start uh, moving with uh, uh, every property, you know, streamline operations. We had to let go um, a lot of people. 
we are almost about 900 people uh, combining the properties and went below uh, uh, 350. And you know those those early days were were very 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 painful. Um, you know to keep you know the the core team that remaining uh, remained motivated motivated. Um, you know the few customers that you had you know to transmit security that you know it's okay to stay it's clean. Um, we are fortunate that um, we had very few cases of employees that work in the hotels that got COVID. Um, and, you know, it was just kind of day by day, you know, every day I'll call you once. <laughs> so, you know, when, when is this going to be over? Right. So, and, and, and we, we just tackling kind of, uh, on a week by week basis there. Thank you. I want to double click before turning to John for his reflections on something that you said that I've heard from many alumni, uh, during the past 15 months is that we're such a global community. And people have really learned by other experiences in different ecosystems as this pandemic has really moved from around the world um, and really been there to support each other during this time. Um, it's, it's been a, a huge advantage, I think, for all of us and just coming together. Uh, John, can you share a bit of your reflections of that time and, and also how you really engaged uh, the team during this time? Yeah, so I think the first thing is that you have to deal with yourself in, in such a crisis, right? Because uh, people will expect you to, to provide leadership guidance and to have the energy to keep things uh, going. So one of the first things that I, I tried to do was really to take one day at a time and not to overthink, especially in a situation that, look, I, I didn't have much control of what was going to, to happen, right? Uh, then, of course, uh, uh, taking comfort in, in your family, in your friends, uh, in, in your faith. And, and the other thing is like to have that self-confidence that it was going to be a very tough ride, but that we would perform uh, at a very top level considering all facts uh, together. We will do a, a, a good job. Wh whatever it happens, uh, at any times, we'll make uh, the best decisions with information available, uh, always thinking positive. And, and that, so that was my, mind, my personal mindset. Then, as Pedro said, of course, the number one thing was really to cut cost uh, immediately and preserve uh, liquidity. The other point that I think was extremely important was really... Uh, your previous behavior, your, your attachment to the community, because at, at that point, many players, like for instance, your lenders, your investors, they became extremely relevant, right? You needed to, at some point, if you needed, you needed to pick up the phone, talk to your lender and ask him to wait, right? In, in certain circumstances, if it was going to be necessary, but at least to tell them, look, we need to work together. Uh, to get out of this uh, together. And at the same time, you need to talk to, to your investors so that they will provide uh, support and liquidity if it was um, necessary. So uh, one thing is, was extremely clear. You don't get out of a situation as big as COVID uh, without a huge uh, uh, involvement in the community. The other thing that I thought since the beginning is that that was going to affect everybody in, in, in a sense that the, that, that the government would need to, to interfere to help uh, uh, um, make things to work in a certain way, right? So it was not a problem that would affect just us, uh, would affect everybody. And, and somehow this time we needed a, a general solution that would support everything. And then uh, over time, that approach of taking uh, uh, one day at a time and, and, and making rational and good decisions um, to keep uh, the lines of communication with everybody very transparent and, and open, uh, eventually things started to improve. The government put some programs. Um, we can go to the operations. Of course, it was very uncertain how this virus transmit. Uh, people were cleaning their uh, uh, produce and everything. So, of course, in the hotel, the cleaning became something uh, um, just unbelievable, right? Um, and at the end, today we know that the cleaning didn't make 
any difference, uh, honestly speaking. Nobody really caught the virus because a surface your con remote control was dirty or not. But uh, again, the remote control became uh, the number one priority in the hotel. You needed to put a plastic bag on it, a tag that it was clean, and, and, and every handle to get in, get out. You know. So we, we had to increase uh, cleaning by a lot. And today we know it's an airborne virus, that the problem is, honestly, is in the air condition. Great, thank you. There's a number of interesting points you, you mentioned that I'd, I'd love to, to double click on and hear from, from both of you. Uh, one, you talked about really that the industry kind of came together and supported and the community. Can you expand on, on really what were some of the roles and the efforts that this, that this really assisted and the role that you guys played um, in really helping the hospitality community? So when I say Pedro, you want to jump in? Um, no, I was, I was not sure if the follow-up was to you or to me. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask, Harry. Me neither. Yeah. Pedro, feel free to, to jump in here. Um, look, look, it, it, it's, it's several, several uh, di different aspects. Um, so, what Juan was touching, of course. Um, I'll divide people in two camps. So, you know, we have the investors and, and lenders that they are tied to, to the financial success of this project. Um, but it, 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 it's, it's a monetary return, right? So it's, it's a gain or it's a loss that they are uh, being impacted. And then you have the people that work uh, at the hotels where you have a personal impact of, um, you know, losing co-workers maybe they, they they lost their job as well um you know the rules are are changing um in terms of what what is being demanded um you know they, they are not even sure if uh, if if they're gonna have a job tomorrow because you know we we had to go through uh many rounds of of cuts um so you know once once we went through let's say the, the absolute worst, which was uh, uh, th things start to get a little better around June. Um, let's say it was clear like the, the worst was over in terms of, of occupancy and, and number of people in the hotel. Now, you know, you, you have to run um, an operation with, with very limited staff. So in one instance, we have... Um, let's say the general manager who is the most senior person in the hotel, he's also driving the van to, you know, to take people to, to the business center across the street, right? He, he's not a driver. He, he didn't sign up to be a driver, but everybody's playing multiple roles. And um, let's say you need, you need to be thankful for, uh, you know, the people that pull together. Um, there was a lot of people that left the hospitality industry and went to, to do other things. Um, when you start to have guests back, you know, there's this interaction of, uh, you know, keeping them happy as well, because um, a lot of places they've been locked down for such a long time. So they're going even locally, you know, they, they go with their wife to a hotel for like two days just to, you know, kind of get out of the house. Right. Um, so, so there's been uh, a, a series of um, um, uh things that we had to do and you know we, we start traveling and you know going to um to the properties and you know meeting with the leadership at every property uh we also have uh union hotels uh in in three markets right so we have to deal with the union uh and you know make sure you respect the seniority rights and recall rights so so, so you know the, 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 there was a lot of moving parts that, <laughs> that, that we have to go through, uh, you know, in order to keep things together. And now, you know, we, we are at this stage that uh, now it's over a year. Um, still, things have not recovered fully, um, you know, but uh, I think people overall, they feel much better, of course, than they did, uh, you know, last year. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, can you, I see a question in the, in the chat here, which speaks to more broadly as people are interested in kind of the evolution of the innovations that you took, you know, it seems that, you know, you guys really 
you know, as you already mentioned, cleaning the remote, there was uh, many kind of evolutions of responding to both the increased demand on you and your team um, and, and responding to the, the evolving safety and concerns. Uh, John, can you continue to expand on some of those operational uh, changes and really how you see them building into the, to the industry as we move forward? So you're going to have uh, um, less touching uh, and less contact in, in a certain way. So you're going to be able to do your check-in remotely in, with your cell phone and, and your cell phone will allow you in many circumstances to open your room directly. So you get uh, an electronic key, get to, to your room and, and do things without talking to many people and touching uh, uh, that many surfaces. Uh, in a certain way, I would say that that's not so good for this virus because it, uh, that's, the virus is not a surface-based virus. So some of the changes uh, um, maybe were an early reaction to, to the situation. Uh, the food and beverage operation also is changing a, a lot. So the issue of buffets and that type of circumstance, I think it's uh, too early to say if this is going to come back to the same uh, 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 practice as, as, as before. I think uh, evolving, I think the air conditioning and HEPA filters uh, are going to be required for indoor uh, venues. Uh, not every area you, you, you will be, uh, you'll be able to retrofit uh, an old building in order to have the HEPA filters. But uh, when you have central uh, air conditioning, yes. So HEPA filters is something that will be very necessary even for offices. Uh, to return, I, I think the investment there uh, will have to occur because uh, um, certainly this is uh, important. And besides that, I, I, I think things will start to come back to how they were uh, before. I, I see the hospitality business. Um, I'm very optimistic. I think it's going to be very um, strong and be in very good, good shape. I think people are valuing even more uh, to congregate, to be together. Even in this uh, reunion, for instance, um, you are doing a tremendous effort and uh, such a great job to put together this for us. But essentially, there is just no comparison to being in Cambridge and seeing our friends and seeing the old places and hugging and, and, and everything. So hospitality is a lot about that, about con congregating people. So uh, uh, the way to the future in reality, uh, I think is like a back to the past. So the technologies that are going to be are going to, to improve productivity. The, um, to me, the biggest, biggest impact in hospitality is the home, the, uh, home office work. I think uh, this has been extremely uh, successful. Uh, I think people are very productive, in particularly uh, moms and dads. Uh, that have to participate in raising the, the children and everything. It was a great thing to be with the children more during the pandemic and, and to be able to work from home and manage everything in most segments, I think has played out uh, tremendously well. I, I don't see people longing to come back to the office. I see people longing to come back to traveling, even business travel and everything. But to the office, uh, azoi azoi. I think it's something that maybe two, three days, uh, you need to be together. Um, but that's, that's what I'm seeing in, in our segment. That's really interesting. And, and I would say, just taking a pause, I, speaking for the folks here at Sloan, we, we look forward to welcoming you all back and, and seeing you all back on, on campus. I know we have many questions coming through in the Q&A, and I want to make sure that we, we save time for them, as well as many classmates saying hi to both of you. Um, but maybe taking a, a bit more time, and, and Pedro, if you could you know, share your thoughts on you know, learnings from this time and, and really how you see the industry uh, evolving and, and how you see that really affecting your central thesis for, for Cambridge Landmark and your portfolio and your, your path forward. Um, you have that saying like you don't you don't let the Christ go 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 wasted. Um, so I, I think um, you know you know 
on top of what João has said about uh, the mobile check-in, you know, th that uh, there was an effort that was in place before and that that's just being accelerated, um, just like the airlines, right? You don't want to go to the counter to, to, to get a boarding pass. Um, in the hotels that we have that they're particularly large, that's, that's significant savings um, because payroll is about one third of our PNL. Um, in a large hotel like Philadelphia, I need to have four or five people at the front desk at a time, you know, especially if you have a large group arriving. So if you can do with less people and you know you have your phone with your key, you know that's, uh, that 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 drives efficiency. Um, there's also other things that Marriott, you know, Hilton, Hyatt are rolling out um, that you're going to be able to order uh, room service. So what, what John was explaining before about less, let's say, interaction, more like using technology to, to, to be more efficient. Um, also, the, the brands have been working with the delivery apps as well to, to integrate that better. You know, a lot of people ordering, you know, DoorDash and Uber Eats um at the hotels um now every event that we make uh you know uh audio is mandatory because there's always going to be a component of people that that do not show up or they want this uh, virtually so um the, the opportunities are expanding um you know we we make a very good margin in audiovisual rental um and because it it, it is expensive um uh, to, to set it up in a hotel, but, not, but now it becomes mandatory. Uh, so we see that already picking up and also allow, it's allowing companies to, to, to have better segmentation on, on these large events. So for example, if you think about, um, you know, I'm just picking a random company here, uh, let's say that's now in the news, like Exxon Mobil, you know, they, they, they might they have a large number of employees. Uh, they might do an event for senior management, but maybe let's say the keynote with the CEO, that's something that would be nice to broadcast to everybody. You know, so you, you'll be able to, with technology to, to, to kind of segment and you know, filter what parts are gonna be available for everybody and what parts are not. Uh, all these conferences that happen you know, in, uh, you know, in New York, Philly, Orlando, Las Vegas, Chicago, Again, you're also going to have an option of, you know, virtual attendance. You know, maybe you don't want to fly all the way to Chicago to see, you know, just one day of, you know, of a five-day meeting. Um, so everything, in, in my experience, you know, it's, uh, I, I joked with people when, when COVID was hitting, is, you know, since I got out of undergrad, it's been, you know, uh, Russian crisis, you know, long-term capital management, and then it's 9-11, and then, internet bubble and you know financial crisis you know the, 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 there's always something happening and the world has a amazing ability to reconfigure itself and you know emerge from whatever challenges presented and you know life goes on right you adapt and and, and you move and um, you know th things you know get, get better eventually so. great and thank you both for for sharing that i think it speaks to kind of the foundation you laid, uh, you laid in the organization that you had. You know, the innovation was already there, uh, the, the team and then the broader stakeholders that you had built relations with. And so that was able to really innovate and adjust uh, quickly and then continue to build on that as we see this climate change. Uh, there's a number of questions for you. And one, you know, you just kind of returned to this, this property in Philadelphia. And so John, there was a, an early question really wanting uh, you to expand on the this the investment in the hotel in, in Philadelphia. And so the question was, is there something about the investment climate there that made it less profitable? Or you know, was it due to local regulations or the economic environment in that city? And so perhaps you could respond to that question and, and maybe also just to expand on, on some of the heterogeneity you guys have across your investments. Yeah. So so I think in Philadelphia, the, the, the biggest issue is what was science. The hotel is very close, 760 rooms, 60,000 square feet of meeting space. It's just one and a half blocks from the convention center. So it was a hotel designed and built uh, for very large gatherings and large crowds. So the moment that became illegal in Philadelphia, 
crowds of more than 15 people, uh, then um, look, it becomes a limited service hotel like any other small hotel. There is no coincidence that most limited service hotel would have between 120 and 180 rooms. That's the adequate size if you have that type of product. So you simply, you, you started, Pedro used to say in, in very good words, you are essentially flying, let's say New York to Washington with a 747 800. And imagine how much fuel that you spend uh, to take off and, and the time that takes to land and so on. And at the end of the day, you are making a short flight and a transportation of uh, 100 people in a plane prepared to transport 600 people. So that's exactly what happened to Philadelphia. Uh, the entire Northeast Corridor, which works as a single economic entity, it's impressive, right? But what happened in New York in the very early stage of COVID was really um, a very, very sad situation. It put the entire region uh, in, in panic and with a very good reason for that. It was dramatic, the situation, very similar to Italy, right? So it, it became the last place uh, to reopen as well. So those, the combination of those, the, the share size of the investment with the restrictions, that's what uh, affected uh, Philadelphia the most. So even if you would compare with California, California, uh, the difference is that our hotel there was smaller, so it affected less. And in Milwaukee, where you had a, we have a very large hotel and a convention center hotel as well, uh, the restrictions were less than in Philadelphia, so also it was less affected. And then uh, Orlando, our, our properties in Orlando, then we had a, a, a much better situation. Florida, I think the crisis in Florida, looking uh, back, uh, was very well managed from the beginning to the end. So Florida is booming, right? Great, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, it's really interesting to see the kind of heterogeneity both on the business and the, what the, the size and uh, customer base of the, of the different uh, properties. And that's very interesting. Uh, you know, there's this interesting question I, I have for you, Pedro, that, that came in, which is, do you think that crowdfunding would be effective in real estate investment? Certainly from the entrepreneurship perspective, you know, we see crowdfunding really changing the types of innovations that we see in the types of companies. I've never really thought about it in the, the real estate industry. Uh, what, is your, what are your thoughts, Pedro, about this? Yeah, so the, there, there are some crowdfunding platforms um, that, that focus on real estate. Um, we actually had a couple of calls with uh, I think it was Crowd, Crowd Street. Um, I, I think it's effective for an asset that you already control. So, for example, we have a hotel and we have some shareholders that want to get out. We want to replace that, that equity base. Um, I think you can craft something uh, in, a, in a crowdfunding platform. If you look at a new acquisition, um and again we, we're doing an acquisition right now that you know we just signed yesterday um it, it's 60 days to close so you know we, we put a million dollar deposit then another 30 days you put another million you go hard you get financing done right um it's very very hard you know given the the speed of execution that you need to do crowdfunding on a deal by deal basis so our view it has to be an asset that you control, or it has to be um, some type of blind pool fund that you you know you're gonna get all the money in and then and then you're gonna deploy and you know it it, it has not been very there has not been a lot of people being able to do blind pools within crowd crowdfunding. Some have done, but but not very efficiently. Great, thank you for sharing. Uh, that's really interesting. I want to return, uh, John, to this point that you brought up earlier about remote workers and how this might really change, um, you know, both business travel, but also uh, personal travel as well. And so we've been seeing, you know, a lot certainly on, on the news about Airbnb and VRBO, you know, having folks stay, you know, renting a place now for two weeks instead of one week or a month instead of 
uh, you know, long weekends before or even the whole summer. Um, so, you know, what are you seeing in these changes? And, you know, how do you see these companies vis-a-vis -vis co competition? So I think those companies uh, have a very bright future. Okay, I, I think it's a business that's slightly different than the hotel industry. Uh, of course, it's when you are looking for a longer stay, you need a kitchen, you need more space for your family to be with you as well, and, and situations like that. So it's a different type of uh, hospitality business uh, from the typical hotel. So I, I see the hotel for uh, doing very well uh, for uh, shorter stays. So it continues to be, uh, as I as I mentioned uh, before. I think if if your hotel is really reliant on the business transient uh, related to office parks, I think you might have a problem. You know, I, I I honestly see uh, the large office segment of the real estate struggling unless they find new ways for people to feel completely safe. I think the commute is, is a, a big problem. So maybe suburban office markets where you don't have the commute is not so heavy, maybe we'll do better. So you might have a donut effect. So let's say a downtown area in Chicago uh, uh, might do very poorly uh, and, and, and the same with other large urban office markets and then the suburban doing better. So I, I, I see hotels uh, doing well. For instance, I think the big box of Philadelphia for the future uh, should do amazingly well, because I think companies, if people are doing home office, you need to put your teams together. So to use a hotel that's a big box that you can put 10,000 people, 5,000 people together, give them training, especially for young people, right? So you're, if you're talking about your more senior positions, they know each other, they know the job, they, they can interact better by the phone and everything. Uh, with Pedro, I, I, I don't even need to talk to him. I know how he's, he's thinking the situation and everything. And we don't need to be physically in the same place place to operate well. But if you are bringing uh, uh, someone out of school and you need to train them, you know, sometimes the interaction is, is quite, quite important. So I, I see uh, the big boxes doing very well. I see all the medical demand in hospitals and so on. So people need to go stay close to the hospital uh, in, a, in, in a situation, medical visits. Um, I see the leisure component doing extremely well. I think people realize how fragile life is and that they need to you know, live the day. So this will increment the, their spending. And vis-a-vis -vis those other areas, I think if you are going to do a larger, uh, let's say a month, two weeks, and, and you want to, you'll be able to work from anywhere. So I think, I think those businesses, uh, VRBO and, and Airbnb are going to do amazingly, amazingly uh, uh, well without a question. And if you are related to the offices, then uh, I think it's a different story. Great, thank you. I, you know, two questions that really came to mind, and I see them in the chat as well as you were responding, is one you talk about, you know, really bringing in new staff, and and this is also a time for for rebuilding and and many industries as well. And so, Pedro. You know, you had, you had mentioned that your organization was 900 plus employees and, and you know, you really had to adjust and that there were a number of layoffs during the pandemic. Um, and so what are you thinking about as you really rebuild your staff and your workforce? Um, and is this an opportunity to really shift the workplace culture as well? Look, the, 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 the situation and, you know, it, this is no secret. It's all, it's all over the news. The, 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 there's more jobs than people willing to work, um, you know, the, depending on, on the level of the position. Uh, the unemployment benefits are playing a role in this. So if you get $15 an hour, uh, you know, working, cleaning a hotel room and you get pretty much the same sitting at home, um, you know, the, the that decision is quite 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 easy to uh, to, to be done. Um, we also had, I think, um, if you talk more mid level and higher level, um, 
there was a lot of people that retired. They they used this this opportunity to, to to retire because you know we we're not out of the the woods yet. It's not uh, back to normal, right? So it's still a lot of rebuilding ahead. Um, and, and and there's people that found other interests, uh, other things to do, right? Or you know, um, I- interesting enough, a lot of people in Florida they went into real estate. So a lot of the former salespeople became real estate brokers and they're trying to sell condos, you know, here and there. Um, maybe they need to do that for six months and see if they like or don't like. Um, so so it, it, it's going to be hard, I think, to, uh, to rebuild. Um, it's, it's not easy to hire right now. Um, you know, we have increased wages. We're being more competitive. But at, a, at every level, from like a managerial position at the properties all the way to to cleaning staff, it's it's been a struggle. Um, but for the people that stayed with us throughout the the pandemic, and you know, they 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 kept the jobs, and we, we the, the most critical people we, we we try to 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 keep on board. I think there is a a sense of teamwork that got developed. Let's say we, we went through this together, right? So, and and we, we came through on, on, on the other side. Um, and if you if you think about um, for the people at the properties, um, you know, if you're able to weather the storm, you know, in some of these very challenging markets, like we're saying, like Philadelphia, um uh, new york you know you know boston hotels are also you know uh, tremendously impacted um you know i think it's gonna do well for for your future in the in in the industry if you you decide to stay right and i i i saw this with investment banking you know before was all the time like you have a crisis a bunch of people uh you know leave and then you know the the ranks get thinner and then people are able to pro- to to progress faster, right? So I mean, this is going to be a, a major factor in the in the hospitality industry. Yeah. Great, thank you for for sharing that. I think a kind of a connected question is, you know, all that you've you've shared about how this industry is is changing and evolving. You know, are you looking really to diversify your real estate portfolio from um, hospitality in the future? Um, and I know, you know, John, in our earlier conversations, you were really talking about, you know, how real estate is changing and also some unique uh, features of real estate vis-a-vis other investments and, and, and really connecting back to this central thesis that you and Pedro had around Cambridge Landmark. Can you, you know, as we start to really wrap up this discussion, can you expand on um, how you guys are, are, might be changing this, but really also how it connects back to why you founded this company? So I think the hospitality business is, is still big enough um, and it, it has a bright future. So uh, in fact, what we've done is that we've raised a new fund uh, recently and we are starting acquisitions. We just signed a new uh, term sheet now in California. So, I think it, so it is changing a little bit the assets that we are buying in a certain way. Uh, a market that I believe is uh, the luxury market. I think the lifestyle market, um, even more so than let's say the business transient. So for now, in terms of Cambridge Landmark, um, we continue to be focused in the hospitality, uh, in the value add uh, segment. Uh, I think uh, the biggest uh, difference from the, the beginning is that uh, now we are making sure we have a bigger component of leisure and the very diversified, let's say, origins of your uh, demand. That that would be on, on my case. And, and maybe certain markets I wouldn't get into. I think the ones that are too regulated, I think uh, one big discussion at the end of the day for this segment is the unions. So, when you have markets that are extremely unionized, of course, for you to, there's no flexibility in cutting costs. Everything is very different. The negotiations with the unions are very, very uh, hard. And, and, and for instance, I think what most affected hospitality was that the US economy as a whole, generally speaking, uh, has done extremely well during this period. The recovery was very fast. 
and, and, and furious in a certain way, right? An economy of $22 trillion growing at 6 7% is like, wow, right? Is, is another Brazil in just one year is like mind blowing, right? And, and you are not in that circumstance. So imagine you are trying to hire people, uh, but look, an electrician that does maintenance in a hotel, he doesn't need to work just for the hotel. He can work uh, uh, in a condo. He can imagine the houses. There is a boom in the housing market. So anyone that's related to construction uh, essentially has uh, two jobs for every person. And yourself in the hospitality business, you need them to build uh, hotels and everything. So I'm just talking about the imbalance between a sector that is so affected and then the economy that is not affected. So in my case, I, I tend to like better markets that you do not have unions. And I think it's a huge, uh, it will impact, it will impact. So New York, Chicago, those markets, I think uh, they are going to suffer uh, a lot in the hospitality business. Thank you. I think, you know, in, in hearing your discussion to say today, it's just a levels of complexity, um, both in, in this industry in general, but also in thinking about how you're responding to these challenges and also moving forward um, as this industry continues to evolve. Um, and so thank you so much, Pedro and John, for, for really joining us today and, um, and walking us through these details about how you, how you have led our com your company. I think it really, you highlight something that we think about as, as slow and entrepreneurs, just kind of the resilience, uh, principled leadership and, and innovation. And I think that was really captured in the discussion today and in uh, Cambridge Lane Mart. Uh, so really thank you guys so much and for coming and in celebration of your 20th reunion. Um, I saw a few chats about this Brazil trip that, you know, the, these, these secrets will not be revealed further on the chat, but it is clear that you have laid a, a really great foundation um, during your time at Sloan and we look forward to welcoming you back in person soon. Um, and so thank you again to all of the attendees for your participation and enjoy the, the rest of the uh, programming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys.